So, today we're going to talk about data. We're going to talk about the world and we're going to apparently talk about our world in data. It's a relatively interesting website with a lot of statistics and a lot of maybe even studies. I'm not quite sure, but there's a lot of data and, and, and yeah. You know, you should definitely also check whether this is true or not. I haven't had a look at this. I just found and also thought that it might be just really interesting to see that and whatnot. But I should check. But yeah, there's going to be more after the intro, as always. And I'm going to see you. As always. Yeah, well, yeah, anyway. <laughs> And with that being said, hello and welcome back. Thanks to the sort of the self development with XJ's podcast. I'm here. I'm sitting here on my stool. Please check out the description or that description actually, because there's a lot of free things that you can get. First of all, there is the link to the podcast because this is actually a podcast and a YouTube quote unquote show. On the other hand, you're also going to get three things, as I said. For example, the free PDFs of the things that I've highlighted in this episode or in other episodes, if I've highlighted something, then it is going to be in a tiny PDF. You can download it and print it and share it and do whatever with it. And there is everything in this that I've gone through in this episode, which is pretty amazing because some people like to listen, therefore we're having a podcast. Some people like to watch, therefore we're having the YouTube videos. And some other people like to read things. And this is why there is also the free PDF. And there is as well some music. So if you do want to have some background music in this video, then please also check out the third link. Or it's actually, I think, the fourth link, but third section, something like that. And there's also just different tracks to choose from. And they're all, I think, an hour long. So, so you should be fine. Everything should be fine. Should be good to go. And yeah, enjoy the episode. And I'm going to see you. And I'm talking to you. And this time the audio is fine because this time I've actually also checked it because yesterday's audio has been just really fucked. Because I'm such a... And haven't really just done anything about it. In terms of like checking it beforehand. Which is definitely something that we all should be doing. If we are recording something. Whether it is an interview. Whether it is a podcast. Whether it is a YouTube video. Whether it is a video in general. Whether it is a movie. Whether it is whatever. We just really have to check whether things are good. You know. Whether everything is working or not. It's really, really fucking important. And we should really do that. But yeah. Anyway. Uh, we're gonna go through it. It's not there, but it's soon gonna be there because here it is. It's actually also really uh, nicely fitted here on the left side of our screen and on the right side you can see me. Well, yeah, anyway, let's do it like, can't I make it a little tiny bit? I have to make it smaller. Well, cool. Uh, the question now is what should we go through? I think we just hop to the ninth one. Actually, don't ask why. Is this, or it is actually by date. Is organic really better for the environment than conventional agriculture? Actually, something pretty interesting. I'm not going to read the whole text there, but I'm just going to have a look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Should we treat environmental impacts equally? Well, it's actually, is it? Is it, is it, is it? Like, it's, it's multiple data uh, or multiple statistics, I'd say. Um, but yeah, here it is. Environmental impacts of organic versus conventional agriculture. Can I actually make it bigger? Well, I could zoom in. The quality is a tiny bit shit then, but it should be fine. So on the left side, we're having organic conventional impact ratio. I think we should just have a look at uh, the... Uh, is it called legend? I don't know. So the blue one is cereals. The red one is pulses and oil crops. The... Uh, um, the green one is fruits, the purple one is veggies, the orange one is dairy, eggs and meats is the uh, turquis, turquoise, however it is pronounced, I don't actually know. Land use, land use, I thought it would actually be more for just the meat one, so the meat is the, this one here, or it, Am I actually just having a look at it in the correct way? Maybe I should actually read this. <laughs> Metrics are presented as the ratio of impacts from organic methods to conventional farming methods. Well, the more I know. Impact ratios higher than one indicate larger environmental impacts from organic methods and uh, smaller than one indicate smaller impacts. Each metric is shown with uh, standard arrow bars. Now I know how they're actually called. Across individual food groups. Lines are grayed out when differences are not significantly different from one. Okay. 
So energy use, share of total energy in agriculture is only 2%. And the top there is actually organic method worse, organic method better. Oh, so apparently organic veggies are worse by quite far, I would actually also say quite. As far as I can see there, I do really hope that, <laughs> that I'm reading this fucking shit correctly. But, but also, also with eutropical, oh, I'm sorry, eutrophication potential is the pollution of water bodies with excess nutri nutrients, which can lead to uh, legal overgrowth and oxygen depletion. And man... Veggies are pretty high on that, to be honest. And to be honest, uh, or to, to be more precise, the organic method. It's actually rarely better. It's pretty interesting. Like, the only time when the organic one is better is when it comes to fruits and greenhouse emissions. Cereals when it comes to energy use. And also dairy and eggs when it comes to energy use. All the other things are basically worse. Which is pretty interesting, but I do really have to point out, and I do really want to say, it is about in environmental impacts of organic versus conventional ag agriculture or agriculture, which doesn't really mean like okay, it's gonna be bad for you, it's gonna be better for you, and whatnot. So it's only about like the impacts or the environmental impacts. So it actually seems to be the case that most often they are relatively bad. I'm actually gonna read this one. We see large differences in impact patterns across environmental categories and food types. For some impacts, one system is consistently better than the alternative, whilst for others, results are mixed depending on the crop type and the local agriculture context, of course. Um, the clearest results are for land and energy use. Organic systems consistently perform worse in terms of land use and regardless of food type. As we explore in detail in our energy entry on yield and land using in agriculture, the world has achieved large gains in productivity and gains in yield over the past half century, in particular, largely as a result of the availability and intensification of inputs such as fertilizers and pesticides. As a result, the majority of conventional systems achieve significantly higher yields compared to organic systems. Therefore, to produce the same quantity of food, organic systems require larger land area. Which makes sense, you know, because you know that a lot of them will just go away. A lot of them will be eaten by whatnot, worms and shit, you know. It, it really makes sense, you know. And I think it's actually something pretty interesting. So you maybe also should read the whole one. Uh, I do really want to cover a broad spectrum today, so I'm not gonna. But yeah, greenhouse gas emissions by sector. Uh, which is the breakdown of total greenhouse gas, or this illustrates the breakdown of total greenhouse gas emissions by sector measured in tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. Carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, equivalents measures the total greenhouse gas potential of the full combination of gases weighted by their relative warming impacts. Waste. It's actually uh, interactive. Pretty nice. So it is actually from 1991 to 2010. So I'm going to have a look at the 2010 one. Uh, we are having greenhouse gas emissions. So it's CO2 basically, I would say. Um, in 2010, we're having 49.50 billion tons, which is insane. Really insane. Um, with energy being like the biggest one with 23.24 billion alone then agriculture 5.08 billion tons um, and the least one is actually waste with still 1.45 billion tons like it it is just something you know it, it really is something chart relative oh well yeah the share of total energy used in agriculture and forestry well this is a little bit of a boring one oh 2% they say in 2009 for agriculture. I mean, it is still quite a lot, kind of. You know, I don't know how, how much energy we're using in total, quite. But I still believe that it is uh, quite something. Wow. This is a... I didn't expect actually people uh, doing something like that. Land use per 100 grams of protein. Land use is measured in meters squared... Uh, per 100 grams of protein across various food products. 
So the first one, we're having a lamb and mutton, then we're having beef, cheese, milk, beef from dairy herd or whatnot, I don't know, pig meat, nuts, other pulses, poultry meat, eggs, grains, fish farmed, ground nuts, peas, tofu, and, and so on and so on and so on. So we're having at the very top with 184.8 square meters, which is actually quite, or meters squared, whatever, um, which is actually quite high for 100 grams of protein. You're having nearly 200 meters squared. I think it's actually called square meters, isn't it? For lamb and mutton. Then we're having beef, which, I mean, of course, like animals, they're going to just take a lot of a lot of space. Then we're having cheese and milk, and the least one is actually prawns. Uh, and the second least one is tofu or soybeans with 2.2 uh, meters squared. And I do want to point out that tofu and soybeans in general, they're a really good source of protein. And especially for people that are trying to not eat too many meat or too much meat, and maybe also on a vegetarian diet or vegan diet or what, what not. Um, I think that's actually a really good um, alternative, I would say. You know, besides, of course, um, nuts and lentils and legumes in general. And yeah, definitely soybeans. Uh, I think, well, peas, of course. Peas, really, of course. And definitely also just all the other beans that you're having. Quite. Really, really good. Greenhouse gas emissions per 100 grams of protein. And uh, at this point, we're having beef on the first spot. And then we're having lamb and mutton. And the least one is actually nuts with 0.26 kilograms per 100 grams of protein. The uh, soy, uh, just look for the, the soybeans are kind of in the lower area with or lower section of the whole statistic there or graph there or chart there, whatever, uh, with uh, 1.98 or actually 2 kilograms as such. Let's actually go back or get back and see whether something else. Working woman, what determines female labor force participation? Pretty interesting. Even though it's from 2017, maybe we should actually look up a new one. Let's go to three. You know, I don't want to be at one, kind of. I don't actually know why. 50 years ago, the average woman had five children. Since then, the numbers has or the number has halved. And I think, like, I'm totally also seeing that, you know, in, in my culture, in my society, in my area, in my whatever. I'm also seeing that, like, uh, and, and this is also something that my, my uh, I've talked to about, or I have talked about with my parents and also with my grandparents and whatnot, like my, my grandparents having, like, just five siblings and whatnot. I'm having two, which is already quite high, to be honest. And, um... Yeah, you know, back in the days, it's been just really normal to have like nine kids and then eight kids and ten kids and whatnot. And nowadays, it's just something that not a lot of people are doing. Like, of course, there is going to be some people that are still doing that, but the majority is not. So in 1950, we're having an average. Average. I, I think it is the average. I assume. Yeah, the average woman has five children. Or is it like average? Start? Like, okay, you know, let's just say like this in 1950, we're having 5.05 children per woman. Then it goes a little bit down uh, up to 1959. And then it goes up with, uh, it's actually a little bit lower. I thought it would be actually higher. Uh, but in 1964, it goes up again to four, uh, 5.04. And then it just dramatically drops with, uh, let's see, the 2000s. In the 2000s, we are having 2.67 children per woman. It's insane. Like in uh, 50 years, uh, it dropped by, uh, let's say, two. Two children. Quite. 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 And in 2000, and what's the last one? 15, apparently. It's uh, 2.49. So it, yeah, it dropped as well. Not significantly, but it dropped as well, you know. Really interesting. But I mean, like this is totally something that, that I have seen. I don't actually know why. Maybe just due to world wars and some shit that... Oh, it's actually been before. Yes, it's actually been before. Quite interesting. The question now really is why. You know, maybe because of um, women working more and just being able to work, which is an amazing fucking thing. Could also be to 
due to that. I don't know. A diarrheal diseases are still a leading cause of child death. How many more lives could ORT save? Or, or ORT, I'm sorry. What are children dying from and what can we do about it? No, I do not really want to talk about something like that. How does the sex ratio at birth vary across the world? Let's have a look at this. It's a 2000 and it was published in 2019, but I just read before 2017. Yeah, or it goes up to 2017. So let's actually see. The sex ratio at birth measured as the number of newborns for every 100 newborn girls. I don't actually know what this is just willing to say me, but uh, anyway, let's see. If we go back to 1962, we're having a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what this is trying to tell me, so I'm not going to go through it. Um, how important are social relations for our health and well-being? Important. I really have to say, like, it is truly an important thing for me. Self-reported loneliness among older adults. Oh, 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 oh. Well, 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 well. In Greece, it is actually 62%. Share of survey respond, respondents who report feelings, feeling lonely at least some of the time. For all countries, estimated, estimates correspond to population ages 65 plus, except in the following cases, US, it's ages uh, or age uh, 72 plus in the UK, 65 to 74, and in Finland it is 75 plus. 65 plus. In Greece we're having like 62%, which is really a lot. Even though it is like a really beautiful country, I assume. Like I haven't been there yet, yet. But uh, but I really believe it's a cool thing. I know it's, uh, it, it looks nice. You know, let's put it like this. Israel with 48%, Italy 47%. Austria, 46, is actually really high. France, 45, Belgium, 42. And the least one is actually Denmark with 25, followed by Switzerland with 26, and the United States, which is something that I could have expected with 30%. And also Germany with uh, 37%, 2005. And what's that? England with 33% in 2018. Pretty, 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 pretty interesting. Can I do it like this? Yes, I can. I do want to have a, a longer one once again. How I use our world in data in my work as high school teacher. More than 8 out of 10 people in the world li will live in Asia or Africa by 2100. That's interesting. Europe. Let's see. Well, what are I saying? From 1950 to 2100. In 2020, what they're saying is uh, we're having 42 million people in Oceania, 653 people in Latin America, 368 in North America, Europe 747, Africa 1.34 billion, and in Asia we're having 4.64 billion. So I don't really know if this is like the, the accurate data and when they've actually started to calculate that and shit. But in 2100, we are going to have, I'll let you know, in Oceania, we're going to have 74 million. In Latin America, 679, which is actually not that much more. Uh, in North America, we're going to have 490 million, which is a little tiny bit more. Uh, in Europe, 629.57 million, which is actually less than in 2020. Pretty interesting. In Africa, we're going to have 4.28 billion and in Asia, 4.72 billion, which actually went up from... In Africa, it is insane because Africa is now having 1.28, quite 1.40, and they are going to have then 4 billion people. This is really a lot. And Asia also grew, but, but not that... Sick. Oh, it actually dropped again. It's really high in 2073 with 5 billion actually, but it goes down once again. Pretty interesting. And we're gonna have the last one. Uh, we're gonna have the last one. But before I go to the last one, I'm having to wait actually. You know, until it is working. What I want to work. Or something. I don't know. Never mind. 
Well, um, afterwards we're going to basically talk about does democracy leads to better health. Published 2019, June 24th. Esteban Ortiz Ospina. Yeah, pretty interesting because uh, I don't know. I don't know, but it seems to be quite, yeah, no, yeah, mm, yeah, mm, yeah. By what I can tell, it's not that of a significant thing, I guess. You know, but, but I don't even know how it is based and in terms of like what the axes are and whatnot. So, so I'm just, I'm just talking. <laughs> I'm just talking and I actually, why isn't this working? I want it to work. Please work. Should I actually just in the meantime have a look at this? Or we? We could. Until this uh, shit is working. Life expectancy versus liberal democracy index. Oh my god, this is really crowded here. Yeah. I'm sorry, because I'm probably not gonna cut that out. Um, the question of today! The question of today is what are you grateful for? You know, in these times that we're having at this point of time, what are you grateful for? It's a really simple question, but I think it is a really powerful question and a really important one as well. A really important one that we all should be thinking about and asking ourselves and all those things. So, what are you grateful for? Yeah. And now we're going to go ahead with like life expectancy and versus liberal democracy index 2015. Uh, shown is each country's life expectancy at birth in years plotted against its liberal democracy index. From zero to one, higher is better. I see. So, um, well, it seems to be the case that there is some... That there is some uh, correlations. I would say correlations. I'm not. I'm never quite sure whether it is correlations or causations and shit. But let's actually zoom a bit. But it doesn't really make it bigger. Can I zoom like this? I can zoom like this. That's fine. So we're gonna have like in the very right we're gonna have the the one, you know. On and the very top we're having 85 years. On the very left we're having, for example, China. Uh, North Korea, Yemen, Somalia, and whatnot, and they all are relatively low. Central Africa Republic, and I, we've been actually talking about this before, they are having a life expectancy of 51 or something, compared to uh, people in Sweden or in Switzerland having uh, 83. 83 is pretty high. Pretty, pretty, pretty high. Um... But yeah, there seems to be like some correlation because I, we can tell, even though like, no, not really. Because um, even though Nigeria is uh, pretty far to the right with uh, 0.43 on the democracy index thing, um, which is in the middle, we're still having like things like, I don't know, Singapore with 0.34, which is actually 0.1 uh, point less quite. Um, and they're still having a life expectancy of 82 years. So, let's see. The causal impact of democracy on health outcomes. Control experience, a pro uh, popular way to establish causality, could randomly pick some countries and make them more democratic. Uh, wait, I'm going to actually zoom out a bit. Uh, da -da 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 -da. We could then take two groups, use one as a control, and wait 30 years to evaluate the impact of democracy on health. While such an experiment is obviously out of the question, sometimes there are natural experiences that enable us to learn about causal relationships following as similar logic. Uh, on such natural experiment was the introduction of electronic voting in Brazil's complex elections. And the paper bulleting less educated and poorer votes, uh, voters often made mistakes and so had their votes invalidated. In 1998, electronic voting was introduced, but only to uh, municipalities, municipalities with at least 50,500 registered voters, which doesn't actually make any sense. Like, if you're doing it, you should do it for everyone, quite. Like, of course, like, it's difficult, but yeah. Other studies have also found consistent evidence in other contexts. Masuyuki Karamatsu studied the 1990s wave of democracy. Of sub 
uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and looked at individual level data for 27,000 mothers who gave birth before and after the year of democratization. Democratization. He found that when multi-party elections produced a near leader, infant mortality fell. However, there was no such reduction in infant mortality in countries where the dictator held multi-party elections and stayed in power, or where leadership change took place in non-democratic way. So, yeah, uh, I think they're basically saying what I'm saying, which is there is not really a correlation, you know, because I mean, of course, also in the very top right with a lot of democracy and a lot of life expectancy, we, even though we're having Japan there as well. But I mean, they're also having a lot of democracy. But we're having Denmark, Australia, Poland, Finland, and and just, yeah, all the other ones uh, that are first world countries. So, yeah, of course, life expectancy is going to be good and high and stuff. And and then we're having Qatar with uh, 80 quite. But they're just not fucking democratic at all. Well, democracy versus government effectiveness. There is a correlation. You know, we can see a line there. At least more than in the way or in the chart before. Democracy is measured according to the liberal democracy index. Higher values than not strong democracy. The government effectiveness, blah, 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 blah. And there we're having, for example, Singapore with a low amount, a low index of democracy, but a high amount of governmental effectiveness or government effectiveness. But yeah, I think that this is going to be the end of the episode here. So I wish you the best, health, health, happiness, and also success. And I really, 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 really hope that you're going to remind yourself when you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy, which basically means just being a nice person and being remembered as a nice person. And yeah, with that being said, three other questions that I'm having for you are, why are you here? What are you trying to change? And what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose because it is important, you know, it's really important to just talk like uh, an Austrian boy when you're just speaking in English uh, and suddenly just changing your accent in the middle of the way. But anyway, I'm gonna see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.